Hello and welcome to today's webinar on how to create demand for zero energy. New Net Zero Energy Coalition research shows industry push is driving growth. Today we have a great panel of presenters. We have Shilpa Shankaran, Interim Executive Director of the Net Zero Energy Coalition, and Edminster, Summit Director of Net Zero Energy Coalition, as well as Carter Scott, President of Transformation Inc., and Sean Armstrong, founder of Redwood Energy. Questions are highly encouraged throughout the presentation. We will also be following this webinar up with a email including the recording of this webinar, the slide deck, and any questions that cannot be addressed during the webinar. With that, I would like to welcome our first presenters, Shopa and Amy. Thanks, Leela. This is Shilpa Shankar, and I'm the Executive Director of the Net Zero Energy Coalition. For those of us, oops, I'm not seeing a presentation here. <clears throat> here we go. For those of you who are unfamiliar with us, and to just jump to the next slide. Um, we are what we call a change agent. Our role in the industry is to, to push the market towards zero energy. And Anne will talk a little bit about more about what we mean by zero energy. <clears throat> um, but we believe there's a huge opportunity. We believe both economically, from a business standpoint, healthier homes, better homes, um, there is an opportunity. It's going to happen. And we think we can facilitate that change. We've worked with um, dozens of organizations, our partners, our members, um, and found that 146 organizations in the U.S. and Canada are doing something with net zero energy. And so we've found this role, we've been asked to fill this role as the industry backbone, which means we facilitate collective action so that all of these organizations in the education space providing training for zero energy, innovative product manufacturers, industry advocacy organizations like Build It Green, um, utilities, government, designer, construction companies, all these folks who are trying to get there, actually by becoming this hub, we're helping them share information, um, use fewer resources by consolidating their efforts and collaborating. And so those types of efforts actually launch us forward towards zero energy faster. And uh, I'll hand it over to Anne. While we're waiting for Anne to jump on, I, I should add, you know, what are we doing? We're actually a membership organization, so our members have availability to our, have access to our research and collaboration and events such as the Getting to Zero Forum that we're working on with Needle Lakes Institute in October. And um, we have two big areas of focus. One is generating market demand through, um, a, a, we're going to launch a national market awareness campaign. That's this marketing campaign for zero energy. And all of our members are participating in that and sponsors as well. So it's a basically a, um, <clears throat> a group effort in kind of crowdsourcing a, a huge marketing campaign for zero energy. And, this, and on the other side, we have, we're creating a hub and a portal for folks to um, find information about case studies, about technologies to make it easier for them to build zero energy. And I'm, Anne, are you there? Yes, I am. Great. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that, folks. So, Shilpa, did you finish your um, promo, promotion of a uh, I did. I oh. did. Yeah. All right, that's great. Actually, uh, we planned that. No, just kidding. Um, but it was a good opportunity for Shilpa to tell you a bit more about what the coalition is up to. What I was saying to the muted mic here was that as many presentations we have launched into a discussion of zero energy only to later have someone sidle up to one of us and say, um, would you mind explaining what zero energy is? And so this is probably superfluous for most of you, but in the event that it's not for a handful, just very briefly, we refer to zero net energy or net zero energy or zero energy, all of which essentially mean the same thing, which is that a given building or facility 
produces as much renewable energy on an annual basis as that building or facility uses on an annual basis. So that's kind of our starting point for any of these initiatives. Now my keyboard is not advancing. See, this is fun. Um, let's try. There we go. Okay. Um, keyboards are so much fun. So, and then in terms of the basic ingredients of zero energy, the next question is, okay, right, but what does that mean in practical terms? And, of course, there are no absolutely universal uh, equations for this, but in very general terms, what we typically see in a zero energy project is, first of all, good attention paid to the basic building form so that it is fundamentally efficient in the structure, the way it addresses the sun, as well as the advantage of other passive elements such as ventilation breezes and so forth. Small heating, ventilating, and air conditioning systems because we have reduced the load substantially through a very good thermal enclosure. Best in class plus loads, and I like to emphasize the best in class because we have uh, witnessed a shift in the tide where for many years, I think, generally people felt that an EPA Energy Star label was about the best you could do. In fact, that's no longer the case. In fact, EPA has itself launched a energy, energy star most efficient label. There are also a couple of other organizations that are assisting in identifying these best in class appliances, lighting, personal and business electronics. And then finally, when we have reduced our loads really to the minimum that is feasible through all these other measures, then we add renewable energy systems to achieve the zero net energy operations that we're looking for. In addition, there are a number of components of zero energy homes that are emerging in the marketplace. These are not in every zero energy home, but they are increasingly becoming standard features and that will be even more so as time marches on. First of all, performance dashboards. And while there have been quite a number of studies that indicate that performance dashboards may not influence occupant behavior always, what we generally find in zero energy projects is that the occupants of these projects are sort of like the earliest generation of Prius drivers. They're very, very interested in their performance and they're very responsive to the data that the performance dashboards provide. So we feel that they are really a fairly essential component of a zero energy home. And I've listed here a number of the elements that identify the characteristics we like to see in the performance dashboard. There are hosts that are out on the market now, and those uh, players are changing very rapidly. So brand X may not be here tomorrow, we will see a new brand Y, and so on and so forth. So rather than citing brands, just these are the characteristics to look for. That it provides real or very close to real-time data, gives you information about how the building is performing in real time, allows some level of control of the occupants over various aspects of the home's performance. Ideally, will be able to interact with the utility to provide some demand response function, for example, to scale back air conditioner use or to delay, say, the operation of a clothes dryer to a time when peak loads have been reduced. And, of course, will indicate for you the energy efficiency performance of the home and the utility savings that are being achieved through the various measures. Moving on to electric vehicles, uh, there's a lot of excitement on this front as well as more and more auto manufacturers are introducing electric vehicles and we are starting to see them used also as a load management strategy, not just to provide a, an emissions-free transportation option in an electric home. And then finally, battery storage. 
uh, many of the utilities around the country have a certain amount of trepidation around the effect of distributed energy resources and how that is going to affect their ability to operate. For individual homeowners, having a battery system will enable you to shift your load somewhat um, to store energy for use, for example, when there isn't as much being produced by the sun and sort of deal with the difference between the utility piece, which typically occurs um, and, and lasts a bit longer than the sun's peak production time of day. So those are all elements we expect to see more of with new zero energy homes as they are being built today and in the future. Where are we now? It is certainly a growing situation. These dots here represent the location of zero energy projects across the country. As you can see from our big bubble here, there, these represent more than 400 projects, the vast majority of which are multi-unit and multi-building projects. And the different colors also represent different types. Before I leave this, though, I will draw your attention to the fact that there are definite clusters of activity. And Shuffle will be saying a little bit more about some of the drivers behind this later in the presentation. So the colors, as I mentioned, represent uh, different flavors, if you will, of zero energy. There are projects that are maybe not quite achieving a zero net energy annual result, but are definitely in the neighborhood. And these are as important to us as those that are achieving it because we're learning from all of these examples. And so it's very important to include these. And they include a number of projects that may simply not have a year's worth of data yet. They may be ready for zero energy when a, a renewable energy system is installed, or they may have a small zero, uh, renewable system that is available for expansion. So there are a lot of reasons why they may not be quite achieving zero energy. Again, nevertheless, all very important in terms of contributing to the overall picture. So that is the biggest segment of this pie here. I guess it's more of a lifesaver than a pie. So we'll call that the line slice of the lifesaver. Moving around to the bottom, the zero energy segment is just about a quarter of all the units. And these are projects that are hitting the zero energy target maybe just a trifle over. In other words, their energy production is slightly more than their energy use on an annual basis. This is also a really exciting number to see. This is uh, perhaps a drop in the bucket in terms of all North American housing. Nevertheless, these are much larger numbers than we anticipated when we began our inventory. Moving around to the orange, we left the blueberry slice behind. The orange slice, net producers. These are projects where their annual energy production is 10% or more above their annual energy use. By the way, I should also add that in the inventory that we conducted, we did not um, require verified performance data. This is purely self-reported project we are, however, um, also embarked on a project to document many of these projects as case studies, and again, Shilpa will be discussing that more, at which time the data will be verified. So just to be clear that we don't necessarily have hard numbers on all of these yet, but these are what the owners, builders, and designers are reporting about their projects. So finally, up in the great quadrant of the lifesaver, we have 31,000 home challenge projects. These are a unique category. 1,000 home challenge is a program that um, works with existing homeowners to undertake energy measures in their homes to reduce their energy use to 75% or thereabouts of standard energy use for comparable homes. So it says here these are retrofits, but actually they are a combination oftentimes of retrofit strategies and behavioral strategies. Um, I have colleagues in this field who quit that 
there is no such thing as a net zero energy house. We really only have net zero energy occupants. And certainly it's true that a house with occupants has no energy use. So we really need to be thinking about the occupants at all times. So these projects represent projects that have actually really achieved zero net energy or very close to it. And it has been measured and verified and not starting from scratch with a brand new house. So a really important part of the puzzle to demonstrate what can be accomplished. Another important aspect of this conversation is the fact that these categories were developed in uh, collaboration with our partner organizations listed, listed here in the bottom left. The U.S. Department of Energy, the Zero Energy Ready Homes Program, the International Living Future Institute and their Net Zero Program, Earth Advantage Institute also has a Zero Energy Program, and the various Passive House organizations, Passive House Institute U.S., Passive House of California, and Passive House International. And finally, as I mentioned, the Thousand Home Challenge. So when we created the categories, we wanted to ensure that this inventory and the database would be as reflective as possible of all of these organizations' efforts and would be able to provide a suitable vehicle for all of them. So we're very excited and honored to have all of them part of this effort. So outside North America, however, zero energy is also a very much an active and a growing movement. These are just a few snapshots of projects around the globe. And then a final comment here is that it's also not happening only at the scale of the individual home, but at the level of entire neighborhoods and communities. And once again, just a few examples here. Very, very exciting time to be active in this field. And I encourage those of you who are not already involved in zero energy projects to don your zero energy hat and pick up your zero energy shovels and get out there in the field. And with that, I will turn it back over to Shilpa. Great. So just to, to kind of pick up from here, and I'm going to <clears throat> quickly go through some more information about our, our study. And you know, I guess backing up a little bit, we conducted this study partially for selfish reasons, we didn't know where we were in, as a market, right? So we say we want to accelerate your energy adoption. What does that really mean? We had to form a baseline. So <clears throat> we went out and, and found as many projects as we could across North America and, and documented a good deal of data about those. And, and the numbers that Anne just presented shows sort of the, the kind of absolute magnitude of what we're talking about. While it was higher than we expected, it certainly isn't much to speak of in the short term. But, <clears throat> but the news is that it is more than it was even a few years ago. And our numbers are showing that the projections are going to increase by orders, by you know, double, triple orders of magnitude in the very short term. So, and, and that, you know, the purpose of this presentation is really to show you guys that we are the ones creating this demand. So certainly we're here. Our job is to jump between the innovators and the early adopters. And for those of you who don't know this paradigm, if innovators are those who kind of test things, they're the people who seem crazy, more scientific, they pick up um, you know, products and try out of out of you know left field kind of things, but but do it in such a way that we can learn from it. However, we don't always communicate with them. So the early adopters, we have to get what the innovators learn over to the early adopters because they actually do influence the early majority, which pushes us into the mass market. So that's our job right now, <clears throat> to take a small number of projects and broadcast them to the world so that the rest of the world knows what to do moving forward and to follow in the advice. Um, so you know, the biggest news that we found is there's a lot of information in the study that we'd love for you guys to read, but the biggest information that we found was important was that 95% of the units, of the 6,771 units, 
were part of projects that were greater than one unit. Um, <clears throat> and by multifamily units, we mean detached, and by single family, we mean um, sorry, detached, and by multifamily, we mean um, attached within a building. And so even within the single family projects, 2,800 of those were part of multi-unit projects. So what this tells us is it's not individual homeowners who are going to come to us and ask us to build zero energy. It's the innovators out there and the early adopters, such as Carter and Sean, who are on the phone today, that have made a strategic decision to move forward and start to go through some R&D. You're seeing this with, you know, Meritage is with KB Homes, now lately Pulte has come out and did a pilot. And putting in the time and effort with the R&D and allowing the rest of us to learn from them <clears throat> and actually seeing market absorption. So, you know, we have, aside from just the innovators going out there and putting units on the market, we also are seeing um, a, new, a new momentum created around the cities that are putting into place policies and goals and programs for zero energy. So those that you see on the slide, you know, Anne and I just facilitated a workshop a month ago with all these folks in the room who made a commitment that by 2050, they were going to have not just new buildings, but existing buildings, so entire building stocks going to zero carbon. And so that gets to a definitional question that varies across them. But the ultimate goal is using clean energy to power the built environment. And, and obviously the first step of that is bringing energy loads down. So this is just a smattering. We know there are so many more, and obviously at the state level we have California doing this. So between the policy programs happening and the individual builders and designers and developers, we're starting to see the momentum picking up. Um, as I mentioned before, you know, California, obviously, they're a large state, so we have to take that into consideration. But California's goal, uh, for those Build It Green members, you already know, for those of you who are not in California, um, the goal is to be, for all residential construction, new residential construction will have to be zero energy by 2020. And all, um, I believe, existing buildings by 2030, and um, and commercial as well. So there's a certain percentage they're working toward. And you can correct me if I'm wrong on that one. But you know, coming in as a second, even though it's a far second, it's still a second. Is Massachusetts, this tiny state, because they put they implemented programs. And what the great story about that was, Carter Scott, who's on the phone here today came to the, the Net Zero Energy Summit that we held in Irvine three years ago and said, hey, we want to do what they're doing in California. He went back to Massachusetts and got a bunch of people together and said, let's try and see if we can get some folks to do that here. And they did. They implemented some funding, some programs, and some goals, and this is where they jumped to the second place. So these kinds of things are happening because people are actually moving the needle by these individual efforts. Um, and then, of course, a lot of builders in California because of what's happening there and the opportunity. Um, top 10 states by buildings. So that was really, this was by um, units and this is by buildings. So California is still right up at the top, Massachusetts. You can see some of the others kind of falling below here. Um, top 20 cities by residential units. Um, exciting in information on this is that Seven of these cities are on this chart because of Redwood Energy, um, Sean, Sean Armstrong's firm, who is going to be speaking later, because of their large scale projects. So that gives you a sense of one firm who's out there is actually influencing such a high number of market, uh, such a high percentage of market adoption. And, you know, if we, we're doing this, there are environmental reasons to do this, but we also know there's a huge business opportunity here. And we think, we think that working together, we can, we can make that happen. Um, so one of the things that you all can do is, um, is go to our case study database and
you know, if you're starting to just try to, you're not quite sure what to do, where to start, and I'm going to flash this here. Um, we have, we're getting close to about 100 case studies here from all over the country, all different types of homes. It gives you a really great breadth of information to work with and, and depth as well. So the inventory was kind of the broad-based trends, and that's what, that's what the presentation showed. But in terms of depth, each one of these case studies, you're going to see um, the details, the energy design, the envelopes, design process, financials, um, all kinds of really great information. And if you join the coalition, we'll put you in touch with these people so you can start to learn from them. And, um, and you can also go to find our, uh, our study right on our website as well. And we encourage you all to join us, become members, become sponsors, start to help this marketing campaign get off the ground. It'll help the whole industry. Think, think Scott Milk for zero energy. And, um, and with that, I'm really pleased to kick this off to Sean and Carter. And as I described before, you know, Sean and Carter have been at this for a long time, and they're reaping the rewards already. And so I've shown you kind of the numbers that demonstrate how the market is actually creating demand, right? How the industry is creating demand. But these guys are going to tell you specifically what they've done and their experiences and, and where the big questions come into play. What about cost? What about available technologies. What about, you know, just market education? And um, and they're going to be able to tell you a lot more. Carter's doing affordable great stuff on one coast, and Sean is doing affordable great stuff on the other coast. So thanks. And uh, who gets this next, Carter? Yes. Thank you, Shelpa. My name is Carter Scott, and I run a company called Transformations. And I'm going to start today with uh, some examples, on the ground examples. The first one we see was our first market rate home built in Townsend, Massachusetts back in 2008. Um, this is where we decided to shift all of our homes to 12 inch thick walls and super insulation standards. And uh, this is where we start. So this is our farmhouse model that uh, we began with. The next one is a custom home done in Western Mass. Um, we've done several different custom homes. This one in particular focused on indoor air quality. So we were careful about like the insulation that we were using in the cellulose to have the customer uh, sniff into the bed. Um, and, and this was a Sarah Suzanka inspired home. Um, it came out very, very nicely. This next one is a project uh, in Devon's Mass. And here's a case where uh, Mass Development, a quasi public agency, put out a request for proposals for a net zero community. And we responded and uh, won the proposal for eight single family homes. And this was the first house built at the site. This came in at about a hers two. This uh, second picture is a, what looks like a standard home from the front, and uh, we had lots of PV in the back. So you can see the pool. This is an 18.33 kW solar system in the back. The homeowners um, have an air source heat pump to heat the pool, uh, and they get about $1,000 back at the end of the year from the municipality. Here's a slide. A little bit on the technical side, I won't go into much detail, but we have uh, on the left homes with full basements. We're super insulating the shell. We're um, doing 12 inch walls, about R45. We mostly use no low density foam, but often uh, use cellulose. We put insulation down in the basement, underneath the slab, up in the attic, uh, minimum R60. And that's the first start. That's the basics. Um, then we add to that other other systems. Uh, we're switching towards uh, air source heat pump hot water heaters. And there's several different manufacturers out there. They help us get towards an all-electric home for fossil-free uh, 
product. And we're also finding the air source heat pumps really help our, uh, we have an incentive for getting 45% better than the model, um, basically what was done last year. And that's $7,000 in Massachusetts, so it's a good incentive. And those air source heat pumps really help with that. Here's a slide on the uh, use the air source heat pump uh, for heating and cooling. Uh, here's a Mitsubishi unit on most of our uh, homes in the 15, 16, 1700 square foot range. We often just do a unit downstairs and a unit upstairs, one 12,000 B2 head in each location. After the last winter, so again, we put all our mini splits up on the wall on the outside. Um, these are uh, nice, pretty quiet condensers. Uh, we're happy with them. Uh, project opportunities. Uh, here's a net zero model home. Um, the owner and developer of this project approached me to build out 31 homes they had approved, um, and they had read about the zero energy work that I had done. Um, so as we do um, leading work and zero energy work, people uh, search us out to do projects for them. Uh, so big advantage of being a zero energy home builder and developer. Here's a, a climate change opportunity. Um, another fairly normal looking house from the front. This is a, a ranch with a higher pitch, kind of looks like a cape uh, on the front. And on the back, uh, we've got a big over 17 kW system. Got a herd index of minus 36 on this home. Um, so with a zero energy home, we can go after uh, the 42% of the CO2 that's related to the building sector. And then by overproducing like this, we can go after the 25% of the emissions uh, that are associated with the transportation sector. So for me, this is a really exciting uh, place to be. Um, with a nice, nice uh, place with nice consequences. Um, marketing opportunities. Here's a, this is a picture inside. Uh, there's a six-page article in Fine Home Building Magazine. Um, you, know, you can't, can't pay for the marketing like that. Uh, we've had uh, this particular project being sold today and the uh, Discovery Channel. Uh, so this is a 41-unit project in Townsend. We're about two-thirds of the way through it. And here we started in 2006, saving about 40%, uh, 60 percent of the home's energy and worked our way to 2008 to have our first net zero home. And now it's our standard practice in the, in the development as well as others. For market outlook, um, I am seeing uh, more and more people in municipalities uh, want this. Uh, at an information session uh, early in the process in Northampton, Mass, uh, we were given an uh, information session to about 60 people. And when the architect mentioned that there were going to be zero net energy homes, the whole room started breaking out in applause. Um, in that particular project, we have 18 reservations in, a, in one phase and eight in another. So we have already 26 reservations and even starting construction. Um, so it really is, uh, really is a helpful, um, in terms of marketing and people drawing, it's, a, it's an industry that uh, people are coming into. Uh, pretty much. So I have uh, time for the questions. Carter, yeah, so um, thank you so much, everyone, um, for sending in your questions. We got a lot of them. Um, so I'm going to ask you just um, one of the questions that came in first. Um, so, so, Carter, um, which agency put out the RFP you responded to? Can you provide contact info for the lead person in that agency? Um, Mass Development is the one that did that. Um, that was back in approximately 2011. Um, I don't think there's a current contact person for uh, another pilot. They're just doing their normal development. But the, 
The organization was called Mass Development. Okay, great. And then, um, what did those eight homes cost to build? What did they sell for? Uh, construction costs per square foot, uh, bricks and mortar, were in the 120 to 135 range per square foot. Um, they sold for 349.9 plus any PV system or customizations. Um, so most of them sold in the 390 to 420 range. Okay, great. And then. What energy modeling programs do you use for your projects? So we use the, uh, our, our energy provider uh, uses the ResNet um, program for the uh, local utility. The so REM, REM rate, yeah. Great. And then, um, let's see. So, someone else said, please explain the calculation for the HERS index. Sure. In, in 2006, uh, the IECC um, had a HERS index of 100, and that was built to code. Um, subsequent codes are bringing that down. I believe 2009 might have put it at around 91. Um, we have a particular stretch code in Massachusetts. Now the IECC 2015, if that gets adopted, will bring the HERS index down to 55. Um, a HERS of zero means you're producing as much energy as you're consuming. And a negative HERS means you're producing more energy. And HERS stands for Home Energy Rating System. All right, and then one last question. Um, so we have Leela, if I could just, hey Leela, it's Jumba. I just want to jump in. You know, um, there was a question about the agency that had been um, the program that that you had participated in that isn't necessarily available anymore at the state level. Um, but I will just say that if you're in Massachusetts, the um, Boston's Redevelopment Agency has their Energy Plus Green Building Program, and they just announce an RFP um, that will be available on June 22nd for energy positive programs or projects. So let me know if you need any more information about that. And on this level, it was that there's an incentive program, a, grant, a pathway to zero grant program, and that was the Department of Energy Resources, the OER. Right. So right now. Great. Thank you all. So this is a lovely picture of our planet. This is why we're doing this. Next slide, please. So um, I'm Sean Armstrong. You can see in the upper left hand corner of this demonstration house that I lived in in 1999. I got my degree from Humboldt State University in natural resources conservation to become a, short, a science teacher to change the world, fully admission driven life. And um, in that period of time, co-founded a grass-fed solar car branch, fully integrated, top to bottom, my lifestyle, organic stuff. The, the, the thing that I worked on that was significant, as a project manager for a for-profit business, it's a big developer in the area that was having a real struggle getting its affordable housing project financed to the state because there wasn't enough subsidy. So when I was there at Danco, we innovated the practice of adding solar to buildings to lower the, rent, the utility bills, which allowed them to dollar for dollar raise the rent, change the entire financial performance of the project. And I'm working with that strategy for a long time now, but branched out as well. So in 2011, we founded Voting for Energy, um, and our and I said, do zero energy housing. That's what we try to do. Next slide. <laughs> so this is Michael. He's brilliant. Um, he got his first degree in physics, his second degree in environmental engineering. He was the technical lead for the world's first cell phone system. I spent the whole career in telecommunications. And then he went to hydrogen fuel cell. Um, and just to put it out there quickly, hydrogen fuel cells are a net carbon producer. This is something that he discovered when he was working as part of that huge picture of folks there. And that's why that lab no longer does hydrogen fuel cell work in any significant way. There isn't a way with hydrogen fuel cells, no matter how efficient they are, to make them anything other than a net carbon producer. 
but just the nature of their efficiency and what can be done. And this is no matter if you power renewably on the grid, it's good on the list. So we put that issue to bed. The network management tools don't mean more. And um, we use a, all the certifications that like most of our energy modeling work, which we use Energy Pro, Realm Rate, and Energy Gauge, depending on which state we're in. And he has been a city council member for quite a while, and planning commissioner before that, and a mayor a couple of times. It's a really wonderful fellow to work with. Next slide. So I'm going to talk a little about uh, market forces, the things that I'm seeing that have changed the equation. So what we've gotten to do uh, so far is we've got 4,628 residences that were solarized as of actually at the end of this year, and uh, then another it's more or less even a switch to new construction in existing houses. Housing. Just say, hey, I'm experienced. I'm going to tell you how this goes. Um, so, to our financing tools, reduce construction costs, competitive funding, and entitlement, and then the landscape of California with 8032. Next slide. Financing tools in California, we got them all. And not only do we have the federal tax credit, but then everything that comes below that list is mostly California specific. So the low income weatherization program, a new chunk of mash funding for AB six ninety three, new solar homes program as a state fund that state voters voted for, by the way. We did it ourselves, we voted in bonds. Uh, multifamily affordable solar homes, another bond funded pace, which is an interesting thing where you do on bill repayment. You can fund the renewable energy and the energy efficiency and pay for it on the utility bill, and when you sell your house, it, the, the loan goes with the sale of the house because it gets paid off by the utility bill. So you can make investments without having to worry about how you're going to sell the house in five years and won't receive the benefits and the da 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 It that just gets away with the whole issue of, of you having to personally invest and not get repaid. Pace is terrific, except that it's like a 7% interest rate. So then um, community choice aggregation and community choice energy, you know, examples of people taking over the utility functions, essentially from the local utility, and become more like the rural electric co-op that powers 70% of the United States land mass, not people, because it's mostly rural, um, where we start investing in local renewables ourselves. And so Michael Winkler, my partner, has led that charge in Humble County, and we've just gotten it now. So we're going to be investing in big wind turbines and big wind solar fields, and fuel switching in people's houses to all electric and decarbonizing the Humboldt County grid. That's happening right now, very thanks to that. And what you're doing money-wise, financing tools, you take the money that is normally going to the utility, shave off some of what is in profit, and you start um, investing back in your own community. There's, there's a significant amount of profit that the investor own utility get that you can um, take over, that you take over the responsibilities as well. And then power purchase agreement, where you have a remote solar array or a solar array on your roof. Um, it's also called community energy over on the east coast where you've got remote solar array. So that, which I believe has been approved in 16 states now, where you can put a remote solar array and have the benefit directly to a project. Very exciting. Um, getting us all past the issue of whether or not your roof is a good roof or not. So next slide, please. What you should see here, this massive line, is that um, since 2010 to 2015, we've had in solar thermal a 60% drop in installed cost. That's the average trend line. I want to point out everyone to the peaks. Notice that the bulk is pretty low, but there's a lot of peaky, expensive projects. Um, I investigated those peaky, expensive projects and they're generally on individuals' homes, so they're an expensive project. But overall, people who are doing government work get charged more. People, it's just a little bit more competitive on the price. But generally, prices are actually a little bit higher for low-income housing than the market says they should be. It's something I press on real hard. People are taking advantage of the benefits and um, not offering low enough prices like they should. Next slide. Um, this is the PV version of it. We've also seen a 60% drop in PV costs in the last five years. Amazing. Now, the slide below that is fossil fuel costs. And it's 1988 to 2012. And what I want you to see is that um, while there 
in the last five years or so since fracking has become a national policy. We've seen a decline in natural gas prices. Just go back a couple of years and you can see a huge spike. We'll go back a couple of years back and see a huge spike. And as Carter mentioned, um, Snow McGinnon, my dad in Wisconsin, he literally couldn't turn on the propane. It was too cold. It went burnt. And he had to like, go to a gymnasium in order to have energy. Now, that, that's a different situation if you're using the heat pump with electric resistance as a backup or even double compressor, like you do above the Arctic Circle if you have energy housing up there. You can always have your heat energy with a heat pump as long as you have electricity. But even if you have propane, you might not be able to use it because it might not work if it's that cold. So I want to point out the, the price volatility, the fact that our prices right now on natural gas are artificially low because we're destroying our water table and having gigantic gas leaks as a consequence of improper supervision. And we're really messing things up with this natural gas in this moment boom. And I'm looking forward to that changing soon. But I think market forces are with thriving. We can point to natural gas, but we have to also acknowledge that coal, the coal companies are all going out of business. If you buy coal just like bankrupt, the one in the rural electric costs are not building new coal plants. It's a different world now where solar and wind are cheaper. So next slide. Let's go into this cheap thing. Um, this slide is reduced construction costs. And this is um, hot off the press. David Hofschild, he's an energy commissioner. Mark Tarrant is an equivalent person at another state agency. But an energy commissioner coming out and saying that, according to their research, they're saying that KV Home City Ventures are reducing the cost of construction by $4,500 by not putting in gas. For me, this is a big strategy in all my projects, is that we don't put in gas. It saves us $200 per fixture, like an on-demand gas water here, takes $200 to get gas to it. Same with the stove, same with the furnace, and then there's infrastructure in the road. Now, that cost, $4,500, it's a little lower in apartments, more like three grand, two and a half. That's still a big chunk of money. So, the Energy Commission is acknowledging that it's cheaper for builders, and then it's the law that says that you have to follow what is the least cost strategy for people. Um, when setting up the building code, this is a big thing to see that electric is cheaper. A decarbonized grid is cheaper. Next slide, please. I want to show reduced construction costs for HVAC. So there's a typo up here. It should say 770, it should say 1070. More to buy a gas furnace with an air conditioner versus a heat pump with air conditioner. It's just grabs off of online. You can do this yourself. So you look at a Goodman, real standard product. Um, they're owned by Duncan, in case you want to know, they're the world's largest air conditioning fuel heat pump company. So the most expensive thing you could do would be to get an air conditioner with a furnace. That's $2,800 above. Now, if you want to save some money, you go get a heat pump with an air conditioner. It's the same compressor, works both ways, $1,000 less to buy it. And there's the gas infrastructure expenses to think about. Now, if you go get just an air conditioner, you can save $230 off of having a heat pump or flip it around and think of the fact that, as Bobby said, the type of should be 230 not 330 um, You can save, you can't save, my point is, if you have an air conditioner, if you just add heat pump functionality to it, that saves you from having to go get a much more expensive gas fire. This is the cheaper way to build from scratch. It works in all climates, from Arctic Circle to the equator. Next slide, please. On the water heater side, same situation. Now, this big table, I'd like you to focus on the second to last column, which starts at 820. And it's up to $1,500. Now, this is from the least efficient speed energy star tank that you can get to the most expensive one or less. And there's a difference in like $700. Um, now, what you can do with that tank, now if you go over into the middle column, you can see that at the source, we're running about 17.5 million BTUs per year. And if we go to a heat pump at the source, Source efficiency, we're burning 8.7 million BTUs per year with the PGE energy mix. 
it's in other words, the western half is much fuel being burned at the source in order to use the heat pump water heater. They don't really cost any more or less to install. Um, some people say they save a few hundred dollars to install, but just for safety conversation, it's not a whole lot different one way or another. It might be a little bit cheaper and use a lot less energy. Um, so, next slide. I'm sorry, to illustrate what that is. It's a small one quarter ton compressor, or one third ton part of it. It's at 4,000 BTU. And then it's a tank, and a heat exchanger that's wrapped around the tank. So you, it's like a little air conditioner on top. It chills the air that goes through it. It grabs the heat off of it, cycles it around the tank, heats up the water. Next slide. Um, I'll talk about competitive funding. So at the top, this is my first uh, all electric, mostly solar powered, not completely, apartment complex. It won competitive financing from the USDA. Um, and actually, it gave it back, and it still kept the solar on the roof, but reduced the solar rate. So they promised 90% solar. They gave the loan back because it didn't work out for them for different reasons. And they decided to keep the solar on the roof at 52% because they made more money that way, it's more profit. That increased the rent enough than the increased utility bills that they profited. No environmental initiatives going on there, just profit. They bought the solar array themselves, which is a more profitable way to do it. Project just below, this is um, America's first net positive apartment complex back in 2012. And this one did win the competitive funding from USDA, rural government. They kept it and put on a 90% offset solar rate that actually performs about 102%. And senior citizens use a little bit less energy than the average population. This is the largest uh, project that we've done. So, next slide. Again, these are projects that um, won competitive financing from the USDA and coupled it with a bunch of other projects. Uh, funding sources. And so this is on top of the nation's largest net positive housing complex, 48 farm worker houses in the dusty Central Valley to Anasama. And then uh, below that was the previously the largest net positive housing complex, which is this um, 25 individual single family homes that are in specific uh, for crack for seniors. And what's exciting about these houses is that, uh, like with Carter, they're putting out enough toll hours in excess. The people can probably drive a car five to 15,000 miles a year, depending upon which house, how much access they have left because they use different amounts. So they can get three cars driving out of it. And the fact that 2014, uh, the greenhouse below, one of the, the low income senior citizens there got rid of his gas car and plugged it into his house. And that was saving him out a net of $300 a month in fuel costs. Big deal. So he's netting a whole bunch of extra money for million from senior by getting an electric car. It was like a five thousand dollar and son just to get used. So the benefits keep on going. Um, next slide. Competitive entitlement processes. So California is definitely a mini state in most of California. As you go into communities that have some serious money, like Napa, wine country, again getting a project entitled is a huge deal. You better promise the moon if you want to get a discretionary entitlement. So the moon in Napa is a net positive community that also has gray water. So these two housing developments that are um, the top one's under construction and the bottom one's going to the building for about a month. The top one is 48 net positive condos, and the bottom one's nine houses. So if you can't get your entitlements, there is a good question of whether you can profit off a project. You can. You're done. If you can get your entitlements, then whether or not it costs an extra $15,000 to put on a solar race or a house, you can sell for half a million dollars or more. <laughs> then, uh, the solar race is immaterial in its cost. The, the whole cost of it is just cost of new business, cost of getting the project done. And your profit is the whole other question, but there's usually lots of it in California for these other markets. So getting entitlement is a, a much bigger deal than the total hours that you saved or not saved. Next slide, please. Uh, AB32, one more solution that 
radically changing California. It's changed their building code. So the 2016 building code that comes out ironically next year on January 1st is enforced then. That building code is a zero net energy ready building code. It does not yet require solar rays. But it is just as rich as it's been, and even more so than many of my proofs in the footing net positive net zero projects. So that's our building code. There isn't an additional expense because it's just the code everyone has to do it. Um, for being zero net energy ready. So I, and I'm no longer having to have these conversations about how much more expensive did it, you know, how much more worth it to make a zero net energy ready apartment versus code in California where I always had to go for more. This is the code and this is what we're going to do and it's going to cost us an extra $8,000 per house to put in the efficiency measures. And that was like six, seven years ago and now it's zero. It doesn't cost any more. Um, next slide. Where we're going with that, you can see the orange is actual emissions. It's kind of older graph, but it's the prettiest one I've found and illustrated. Um, our 2020 targets, you can see in green where we're going and blue where we would have gone instead. And we're actually exceeding our goals right now in California. Things are, our emissions are actually dropping faster than predicted. And we're all very excited about that. So we're, we're doing better than we thought. So, um, take it. I jumped ahead of myself. Uh, next slide, please, slide 17. So it's saying that AB32 triggers the 20, AB32, the Global Warming Solutions Act in 2007, triggers the 2016 code, which is zero energy ready. Looks like this. You've got uh, maybe above deck insulation so the heat doesn't get into the attic, or just different strategies for roofs and cool roofs. Maybe you insulate below the deck, up against it. The deck with the switch right there does a great job of keeping it at a pool before it gets in. You can do like R20 up there. Uh, putting the ducts in conditioned spaces because most ducts leak 50% of their energy into the environment, so you should put it where you want it. Uh, there you go. Next slide, please. Um, we're seeing insulation factors more like what Carter is doing, but not nearly. Carter, <laughs> my hat is off to you. Here. So much better in the insulation factors. But we do have one of the most moderate climates in the United States, in California. So it's not the same issue. Passive house prices is less of an issue here because if at the end of a decent efficiency job, you're at maybe 500 kilowatt hours per year total of heating cooling demand, and your plug loads are at 2,000, then your next thing you do is go get Energy Star TVs. They'll increase the wall, or increase the efficiency of the HVAC system even more. That's California. Um, that was my last slide. So that slide is just people with big easy money to the field and more achievement. So, so I'm ready for questions. All right, thank you, Sean. Um, let me go and get through the questions. We got a lot of questions that came in from all of the presentations. Um, I'm sorry, we um, are running a little bit late, so we're going to take a few questions from each of the presenters, and then the rest will be followed up, or uh, will be. Um, Answered any follow-up email. So, um, Sean, the first one that we got from you, um, from Brian, so what did you mean by getting your entitlement? Entitlement uh, means, well, frequently in California, people will come to a piece of land that's known ag, and they say, oh, I want to put houses on that. And if you go to local city and say, I want to develop this farmland as condoms, and they say, no way, we don't want any new development. This your entitlement to the process in which you go and get your permission slips to change the zoning, to mitigate your traffic impacts. Um, in the rest of the country, there's NEPA. In California, we have CEQA, and CEQA is NEPA, but lots more. Um, so, getting permission slips to develop of all different sorts is the entitlements. And if it's discretionary, then you have to make the discretionary approval body happy. Um, and then we have another question from Bill. So, um, can you explain how AB32 triggers 2016 code? Yeah. So, since AB32 was passed in 2006, and for instance, there's been a number of these uh, committees and scoping hearings as they try to establish a glide path, as people describe it, the slow this, uh, ascent into a zero energy building code. So, the building code of 2008. Was more rigorous than the one of 2003. The one of 2013 is 
more rigorous than 2016, you understand. They've been stepping up the requirements every few years to the standard building code project in order to ramp down the emissions associated with residences and, um, and simultaneously also providing a lot of public financing to assist. So that's the uh, 2016 code now is um, so energy efficient, it's pretty easy to solarize that. It's cost effective if you could do it. Whereas older houses are so inefficient that you might add roof space or just too much. All right, great. So um, with that, we're going to head to some of the questions that we got for Shilpa and Anne. Um, so the first question now we're going to answer today is, um, regarding electrical vehicles, how is the source of the electric used? For example, coal fired plant that is producing um, electricity. So how, um, what is, so you can repeat that. Regarding electrical vehicles, how is the source of the electric used? Yeah, great question. Um, I think that I, when I commented on the electric vehicle, I did say on an electric home. So ideally, we want to see the electricity for the vehicle provided by the PV array so that it is clean energy. Clearly, that is not always the case, and there are plenty of electric vehicle owners who are still driving, or rather still driving their home, living in homes that do not have renewable energy on them. And so those vehicles are dependent on electricity from the grid and whatever the mix of fuels is part of the grid in that region. So um, they may not be quite as virtuous as they wish to be. So it's a process. You know, we are in a transitional period where we're moving to cleaner homes, cleaner grids, cleaner vehicles, but we're certainly not all the way there. And then one more question for you guys. Um, so uh, this is from George. So he's asking, why not use the Department of the Environment definition of the term of the term net zero or zero net, etc.? So why not use the DOE definition of the term? For uh, this question regarding for the inventory or the database, perhaps. I'm going to assume that's the case. It's clear based on the question, but let's go with that. Yeah. Um, so there, there's a multiplicity of definitions out there in the universe. And rather than use one exclusively, we wanted to make sure that there was kind of a loose fit in terms of the way we're inventorying and um, categorizing the projects in the database. However, as the projects come into the database with full operational data, we will actually be using the Department of Energy's definition to determine where they fall in the category. So are they near zero energy, are they at zero energy, or are they net producers according to the DOE definition. For those that come in that are not verified or that don't have the data yet, those are all going to fall into the near zero category. And for those purposes, since we don't really have the data, we are pretty agnostic as to definition. Hope that makes sense. All right, great. Thank you so much. Um, so we're going to get a few more questions from um, Carter's uh, presentation. So one moment while I go find that. And just like you had Sean here, I would um, I, I like the DOE definition. It is uh, we've been talking with site in this whole conversation today. We're using a site-based definition. The DOE is the source-based definition. Um, but if DOE is, I think, more comprehensive, it would be best for us to move towards. All right. Um, so Carter, we're going to have a question for you. Um, uh, Peter is interested or curious uh, to know from you, what are the demographics of your z and &E buyers? Uh, they, they range from um, people that just want to buy a house um, um, and, and other people that are seeking them out. Uh, we have a fair amount of empty nesters in the Northampton project. Um, 
in the Devons project had a really good school system. So we found about probably over half of them uh, were with school age kids and then um, just uh, maybe a couple of empty nesters. Um, other projects um, range um, from you know, some, some uh, first time home buyers, especially on the affordable units, um, deep restricted affordable units in, in Massachusetts uh, require a first time home buyer or um, somebody that's uh, over 55. Uh, so we have a, a variety of demographics. Great, thank you so much. And then one last question for you um, from Jean. So she's asking, how do you deal with snow on the channel? Ah, great question. Uh, up until last year, <laughs> uh, when the, the next day the sun came out, comes out, uh, the panels warm up and the snow just slides off. Uh, last year, uh, so this was winter really before last, uh, the snow again, when we got three feet of snow, it would lock in the, for, for longer. So we'd see a week or two uh, where some panels were snowed in, but that was a, a rare occasion. And that's usually with a, a roof pitch of 10, which is a little over 40 degrees. Great. Thank you so much, Carter. Um, well, I would first like to thank um, all the presenters and the attendees um, who joined us on this webinar today. Um, I think it's a very um, productive and very insightful uh, webinar. So uh, as I mentioned at the very beginning, um, if your question was not answered, it will be addressed uh, in a follow-up email along with a recording of the webinar as well as a slide deck. So please look out for that sometime uh, later next week. Um, and, and thank you so much for joining us today. Please um, contact us if you have any further questions. All right. Have a good day, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye.